thank you for being here because I, I know it's, it's hard right now. I think everybody is getting lunch right now. So when you're sitting here with me, I am thankful for that. I will try to, to make it as like, light as possible, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about something that for me it's really amazing, that's semantic. And uh, most of the people, they don't know what semantic is. O honestly, usually when I speak about semantics, or semantic web, these kind of things, it's like uh, asking for the age. Like, only all enough people, they know what semantic is, and probably young people, they still don't know what semantic is. And I think I didn't choose the right title. It does not really look appealing, because what we are trying to do, it's something that's really big. It's like we're trying to create the semantic web on chain. But I, I'm going to go step by step. I'm going to give you a little bit of background about, uh, about me. So being I discovered blockchain in 2012. Well, n nobody called it blockchain at that time. Everybody was speaking just about Bitcoin. But um, in all of my path as a, as a developer, as a tech guy, I was like focusing on blockchain, but not that much on, um, on tokenization or DeFi or, this, or crypto, but on cryptography and also on digital identity. So five years ago, I started an association, and the idea of like, this association was to focus on creating a, a blockchain for, for SSI, for self sovereign identity. And it was cool, honestly. Like we, we got like more than 500 companies. It grew a lot. Of course, we had a lot of politics in it, and it was a big fight. But at that time, I was really excited about the idea of self sovereign identity. Probably you're familiar with that. Imagine that you can have just one identity, and it's owned by you. And then you can use that identity to interact with anything, with, like, of course, government, local government. But then you can go to the gym with your own identity, and your identity becomes portable. You can bring it everywhere. And this is why I think this is like the classical tragedy of the commons. I, I think this is how I felt like everything was falling down. Because if we can do this kind of digital identity, it means that I can have my identity, I can have my data, and I can just like use it everywhere. So everybody was focusing on the solution, meaning on the SSI, verifiable credentials, cryptography, but nobody was focusing on the use case because nobody cared. And the thing is, like, I can create this credential that, oh, I studied somewhere. In fact, I try to do that. Well, that's one of the things I try from the association. So I just go to my team, big team. I told them, OK, we need a standard for a credential to prove that I studied somewhere. So I studied in La Salle, for example. So I can prove that, OK? What do you think it happened? So <laughs> basically, I'm, I'm a tech guy. Tech guys, we are really lazy people. For us, you know, we just go, we need a standard, okay, forget about it. I open JSON file, we have a name, a date, an age, okay, that's a standard, let's go. And we can fix it from there, we can evolve it. But when you work with big associations, with corporates, um, we were, I work with uh, W3C, ITO, ISU, these this kind of things, and basically they wanted to have the perfect standard. And after three years, three years, there was no standard. There was a fight between three countries, and I think it was Spain, Italy, and Germany, on who was making the standard. And everybody was arguing who was the best solution, who had the best solution. But nobody was writing a standard. No even one line of this JSON file that we needed. Nobody cared at all. And then I saw the same on all of the SSI solutions I was looking at. I was like talking to a lot of startups. I was like helping the European Commission and, and a few local governments on, on SSI. I think nobody understood what SSI was anyway, but nobody cared about like, getting on a common language on the use case. And everybody was focusing on the big solution, on the cryptography. And long story short, we failed. We never got anywhere. So, and this is because probably like, most of the people were more, in, more interested in the ego side, so having the name on the standard, than on actually building a standard. Um, but it's not just me. If you look at back. Like, that's been going on for ages. And well, this is a funny story, because Tim Berners-Lee invented the inventor of internet. Probably you know that. Um, after the internet, he decided that we needed a better internet. So we needed a semantic internet. And he called it Web2. And of course, then LinkedIn, Twitter, um, everything like this happened. And he said, no, no, I'm going to call it Web3. <laughs> Good luck. There's a talk of Tim Berners-Lee back in 2009 that he was already speaking on semantic web and linked data. Once again, to have a semantic web, a web that everybody that has a meaning, that I can understand what's there, the data, 
not just the presentation, the data. Once again, we need the standards. Probably, you know, there's a few uh, projects like Schema.org or others that they try to get these standards, but once again, they failed. Because like a standardization, it's a coordination problem. And that's something probably that blockchain people, we know better than anyone. That's why we have DAOs. That's why we are fighting on governance on how to build better standards. But if you think about the standards like RC20, I know Fabian, the guy who wrote uh, RC20, he never, ever wanted to do a standard. So basically, once again, he was a tech guy. He just needed like a definition of what, we, what he was doing, so we, he just wrote down. He never thought that, that what happened with RC20 after a few, a few months or a few years. So, but anyway, this problem is not new. So having standards, having this like semantic meaning of data that allows not just people, but anybody, computers, anything to communicate, it's a really, really, really old problem that a lot of people have been trying to solve for a while. And that makes me think that probably it's like I'm trying to solve it again anyway. So, but let's go to an easy de definition of, of semantics. That basically it's like it's a study of meaning in the in, in language and communication. Once again, like it's how to give context to, to things. So basically, I use this example. It's like being able to identify I'm Groot as something really universal, like I like pizza or the meaning of life. It's 42. These kind of things that without the meaning uh, and, and the significance of the data, we are, not we are not going anywhere. So that's something that basically on Web3, I think we can achieve. And, but to do that, we need to change our mindset. We need to change how, like, our, our approach to standards. We need to change like, the idea that standards is something built by experts. By the way, I don't, the idea of expert, I just, at some point, I got really tired of it, like, because I saw that all of the experts were not working on anything at all. Their work was being an expert. So we need basically builders. And we need to think of standards not as a business case, not with business model. I'm usually, I used to think that even digital identity should have no business model to work. But then we have to, we need to do a, this new approach to standards like public goods, something that everybody can use. But if you think of natural language, if, we, if you think like English, Spanish, it's a public good. So why standards should not be also public goods? But then probably the most important thing for me on a standards, if we think about them, is that we need to change also the way that uh, we build them. I don't know why most of the people I know, organizations and big companies, they just want to build the standards. I don't want to build the standards. I don't care. Basically, what I think is that we should like, create a schemas that everybody should, like, of course, find them easily, like GitHub, just go there, get, look for all of the standards, all of the schemas. And if a lot of people adopt that schema, then maybe it becomes a standard. But Let's forget about building standards. I think that's a big waste of time because nobody will adopt them just because you said so. It will become a standard because everybody uses that. Same thing with RC20, by the way. And to do that also, we need to have a built-in incentive system. Why should I build the standards or schemas? Why should I even worry at all? Because maybe there's a, even an incentive or a way even to make money just by creating the best uh, schemas possible that everybody can use. And one, once again, I think it's quite important um, to think that because they are public goods, it's not just me building schemas that they become standards. It, it can be a DAO. It can be a lot of people coordinating the schemas in a way that they can evolve. And also, it's really important that the schemas, they, they, they don't need to be perfect. I don't know why. Like people, when they build the standards, the standards, they need to be perfect and cover all of the situations. But with the schemas, we don't mind. It's like, OK, whatever we have, it's gonna, we're going to head. We're going to create a new version anyway in a couple of weeks, so that's fine. And also, we need provenance and trust, so a way to verify who did the standard, who's using that standard. Because then we can create this, like, imagine a GitHub that you just go there. Once again, like, going back, engineer, lazy guy, just go there. I need a standard for an NFT. And not, not a big standard, not identity, not a big standard like um, payments, you know, this kind of big name standards. Uh, maybe, um, you know, mm, sneakers. Standard for a hat, standard for something really simple. But that's cool, because if we have a standard for a hat, for an NFT, then that hat can be a hat not just on my game, not just on my platform, but anywhere. We can just like be, be that NFT becomes interoperable by default, just by following a, a standard. 
And this is it, like I'm going back a little bit because this is really important and it, it's, I just want to focus on this. Forget about building standards. Let's build the schemas. Let's create a schemas that people can, and really simple schemas, okay? Not just like complicated schemas. Anyway, um, and then I'm gonna speak about what I'm doing. And until now, I was talking about the reasons that brought me here. How I got interested in digital identity at the beginning, why I thought this ad, unique identity with self-sovereign uh, kind of power would be interesting, like having just one identity to interact with everyone, and how I found out that it was impossible to do that. It was impossible to have a unique identity unless this identity could talk to other identities. It was like really interoperable. So this is what I built, basically. Um, at the beginning, I just did an MVP. I'm coder, so I was bored. I, was, I started like coding an MVP, and it was a framework to coordinate the schemas as public goods. The beginning quite simple. Show that to Arwif. Arwif liked it. Arwif, they decided to invest. I was using Arwif because probably you know it's a blockchain for storage, but it's permanent. So you pay once, write forever, it's there. And at the end of the day, after like a few evolutions, the solution that I was building was something really. I, at the beginning, I, I could. It took me probably a couple of hours to explain it. Right now, I, I can explain it in a few sentences. But what we are doing is creating on chain documents which, by the way, they have three things. Like one, they have unique names. So yes, it's a name service. Second one, you can have an, a history of the document. So you have versioning, just like in GitHub. 101, 102, you can do a patch, you a minor, or a, or a major update. So you can evolve your data. But probably the most important thing, it's not that. Even, even that's cool, because we have traceability and provenance at the same time, because we have the unique names and, uh, and the versioning. But then, the most important thing is that they are semantic. What it means that I can link that document to one or more schemas. So I can say, OK, this is a schema, this data, this on-chain document, uh, it represents a company. But maybe it represents a company that is a startup. I can keep on adding schemas to add more meaning to my document. So anybody, people, I just can go there and, and see all of the fields and say, OK, and I can see the description, see the description of the, of the schemas, and I can understand, OK, this is what it's about. I know, I know I can understand this is a startup, but maybe it's not a startup, it's an NFT. And at some point, I can say, OK, maybe this is a wine. It does not have to be even Web3. We're starting with Web3 because we know many people. It's our, you know, our, 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 uh, our land, homeland right now. But the idea is that imagine that we cannot create all of these on-chain documents, a lot of them. And because following the same idea of the semantic web, we can interconnect them, OK? We can create links between these data islands. And these data islands, of course, they have meaning. They can evolve. But then probably the most important thing is like I can just connect. And I can like relate my NFT to my company, my company to my smart contracts, my smart contracts to my security audits. And I can see who did the security audits and who's the investor of that security audit. So I can just like walk around and see all of this, imp the, this information. So information becomes cross-chain, even if it's on our wave, but we can use Falcon or any other. It doesn't matter. But probably the most, the most what I like more about this is that, for example, right now we are building a completely decentralized uh, mapping of startups, where anybody can have their own name. By the way, we don't sell names. We don't like that. Uh, we don't want this to be the business. So basically what we do is we have a curator system to that you can get your name so it can be trusted. But then imagine that I have like information of my startup and I keep, I keep adding schemas to my startup because maybe I'm raising, maybe I'm hiring, maybe I go to events. So I can update and create a, like a public profile that's completely open because it depends to me on adding schemas or I can add new schemas. But then if we get enough platforms building on top of the platform, startups, frontends, apps, whatever, once I change my data just once, on my profile, owned by me with my keys, automatically it can propagate to all of the platforms using this. We are, of course, as you can imagine, like everybody's doing that, training AI models with this in a way that we have data that's trustable, but it's structured and updated always. So me, if I'm an investor, I can ask, okay, I invested in this, this is my thesis, all of this is my public profile, who should I invest next? Or should I trust this company? Or oh, a lot of things. So we can build a lot of innovation on top of this. Okay? As I said, like changing the way we look at data, instead of me pushing to a lot of platforms, why don't we do it in the other way? Platforms like getting information from me directly, and we can save a lot of space in databases, by the way, and just because it's structured. And we can use that also for NFTs. Once again, same example. If I have an NFT, it's an NFT. My you know, weapon is a weapon anywhere. My, my song 
it's a song and can be played anyway. So if you want your handle, you want to play with the protocol, we have an SDK, a CLI, just talk to me and I can give you names and we can play with it. Thank you very much.